Good morning everybody. It's about quarter to 11 in the morning on the 12th of February 2019. Welcome to podcast number 28 which I have entitled Pyrolysis the Elements. And this of course is my first podcast of this year. But before we get into the nitty gritty of the subject I just want to give a bit of an update here. I, I realized that in my last podcast on the subject even though I said I was taking a break over Christmas um, the break was longer than I expected and some of you have been concerned about how long it was going to be before I uploaded the next podcast this podcast um, so it was a busy Christmas Christmas here in the southern hemisphere of course is our summer so we're talking about the summer holidays which is the busiest time for me at work I also said that um, I was going on a road trip with a friend of mine from the States from here in Hawke's Bay up to the very top of the North Island and that um, part of the reason for that road trip was for us to shoot footage for a documentary that we hope to be producing over the next couple of years and it was a great trip we filmed almost a terabyte and recorded audio uh, almost a terabyte of data Uh, so a lot of stuff to sort through and edit and make decisions about what the final documentary is going to look like and that's going to take some time Uh, At the same time, over Christmas, uh, my situation has changed relative to my position as a tutor or teacher of Hermetic Knowledge. For the most part, over the last couple of years, I have been trying to uh, shift responsibility for teaching, which I've been doing for the last 30 years. Um, over to the next generation of students that I've been teaching who are now at the advanced stage and because typically there has been a lot of mucking about with that situation I have ended up with a number of students that I wasn't expecting to have at this time which has had a big impact on other projects which I have been involved in and that includes producing these podcasts So my original intention, when I thought my hands were free from tutoring, was to produce about two of these podcasts a month. But I'm just giving notice now that um, the easier podcast to produce, I may get two or maybe even three a month uh, recorded and uploaded, although I doubt it at the moment. But um, I just want to make it clear that in the near future at least um, I can't give any guarantee about how often I'm going to be uploading podcasts to the channel but my intention is still uh, to average out at one a month uh, until I clear my backlog of uh, tuition with the students that I've had to take on Uh, at the same time I'm training a small team of students in the lab work and their training has got to the point where it's switching over almost from the theory and philosophy to the practical work in advanced alchemy and so probably for the next six months or so my commitment to that is also going to increase which is going to have an impact on other projects that I've been involved in. Long story short, that means that I can't guarantee the regularity of uploads to this channel, but I I still want to emphasize for anybody who is like very keen on these podcasts and is a little bit anxious when there's long gaps between uploads, that this is not some casual fly-by-night thing that I'm not interested in. These podcasts are one of my main concerns amongst the other projects that I'm involved in and I still have a lot of information 
that I want to uh, video and record and upload to this YouTube channel in the foreseeable future. So there's no need to be concerned that I may have suddenly um, fallen off the edge of the map and decided to give up on this project without saying anything. I just simply wouldn't do that. If some um, unexpected event happened where I can't complete this project in the way that I hope to, I would give a uh, full explanation of that situation um, as soon as I'm aware that, that that happens. But that is not my plan and like I say I still have a lot of podcasts to make yet with a lot of very interesting information about my views on the hermetic tradition and authentic hermetic instruction or training. So with that out of the way now and reiterated again for those who are concerned let's now look at the subject for this podcast which follows on from the previous one where I talked about primarily about the nature of the philosophic and universal chaos and its relationship to modern chemical and knowledge and the knowledge of physics so we've discussed the nature of the chaos which is the beginning of the great work which is the process of making the philosopher's stone and the next stage in the great work is the separation of the four alchemical elements out of chaos as tradition and hermetic history and mythology asserts to us this is the natural progression of the unfolding of creation that we begin with a state of chaos and that then God created a situation in that chaos in order to remove and separate out from the chaos what we call the four alchemical elements so in this podcast we're going to discuss the basics of what that involves as far as laboratory alchemy and um, the theory and philosophy connected with those four elements being removed from that original chaos. I'm going to begin here by briefly recapping some of the information which I presented in the previous podcast on the nature of the chaos and what it contains and what happens to it as pyrolytic distillation decomposes our crude matter so that we can obtain the products from which we will separate the four alchemical elements. So for our purposes here, this green cube in the middle of this diagram represents whatever substance we take to begin the alchemical process. So this could be plant material, it could be an animal substance, or it could be a mineral or metal that has been properly prepared for the work. When we apply the alchemical process, beginning with pyrolytic distillation, no matter what kingdom our beginning material, our crude matter, comes from, no matter what kingdom it comes from, the process is almost exactly the same for each kingdom and the products and the way we deal with them are almost exactly the same for each kingdom. The differences are so small that they are really insignificant when we understand the nature of the alchemical process itself. So for the purposes of this podcast we're going to state here that this green cube is a metallic acetate because philosophically speaking 
metallic acetates are the substance which are most often used to begin, philosophically speaking, to begin the great work with. So let us, if we like, assume that this green cube represents lead acetate and that we're now going to consider what the old adepts taught about the nature of the starting material, this lead acetate. So when the old adepts looked at physical reality, looked out of themselves at their environment and considered substances in our environment, in their environment, the first thing that they understood about these substances is that everything that they saw, all physical objects, vegetable, animal, mineral or metal, were founded in or sourced from a universal fire, an unusual fire, the nature of which we do not effectively understand because it's so remote from our everyday experience. They consider this universal fire to be the first building block of physical matter and they believed that this universal fire when it was exposed in physical reality it appeared as a red smoke or fume a fleeting red smoke or fume and that's what we can see here in this slide that red circle cloud like circle in the center of our green cube now represents the very heart of physical matter and so the very heart of our crude matter or lead acetate that we're beginning our process with when they looked at that lead acetate and saw it as the prima materia or the chaos of the elements or the crude matter or the starting material of the great work they believed and insisted that at the very heart of this material in its deep core this red fume resided and acted as the ground bed upon which physical matter was constructed. Then they taught and believed and insisted that this original universal fire which they saw as a red fume evolved into a white humidity a vast universal ocean which they sometimes referred to as the hermetic sea which was appearing in the physical world when it appeared in the physical world it appeared as a white fleeting smoke or fume. So we can see here now in this slide a somewhat symbolic depiction of these two fumes, the red and the white. The red is in the heart of the white fume and both are in the heart of physical matter. The white fume, this white fleeting motionful gas or smoke or fume obtained its motion and its flexibility and its changeableness from that fire which is at its core. So in this picture we see two things presented. That red fume which is the basis of all matter, the white fume which it evolves into through condensation when it thickens or coagulates it turns into that white fume which they refer to then as the chaos of the elements because they say in that white fume are four conditions of matter awaiting latent as potential substances or conditions that are the basis of all physical objects in the physical reality.
if we then heat this crude matter with increasingly intense heat in order to break it down or decompose it because matter as the old adepts insisted is constructed primarily at its core from these two fumes when we heat to decompose this matter it will break down or revert into these two fumes the first fume which arises out of this crude matter when it is heated to the minimum required temperature is a white fume that looks like a kind of a white smoke and they said to themselves when they first recognized this happening thousands of years ago when they first experimented with pyrolytic distillation in primitive ceramic alembics and they heated different materials and those materials began to decompose under the pressure of that fire and that white fume arose they said look this is what physical matter reverts back to when it is decomposed into its most primitive state in this photo here we can see this very process being carried out in the lab right at the bottom of the photo under this plate is a heating element and in the bottom of the flask is the crude matter itself and we can see that it's already reached a temperature where a white fume is being given off it's filling the flask and coming up into the neck of the still and down into the condenser and we can see some droplets forming here as that gas is condensed back into a liquid this is the very beginning of pyrolytic distillation and the first stage of the process where hermetic alchemists believe that now this matter is reverting back into the substances which it is composed from we can see in this picture a closer up photo of that white fume rising into the still head and flowing into the condenser and we can see those liquid droplets forming in the condenser tube itself in the receiving flask which is this flask here which is sitting in a bath of ice to keep it ice cold so that that fume will condense properly and completely into liquids in that receiving flask we see two substances the first substance which sinks to the bottom is a milky watery liquid which the old alchemist called lac virginius which means virgin's milk and floating on top of that lac virginius is a very watery volatile oil like substance which is that golden material that we see here in this photo and a little bit more clearly in this picture and a good close-up of in this picture we see at the bottom of the flask that milky liquid which is the white fume condensed and floating on top of it is this golden essential oil so this white milky substance here is the white fume condensed into a liquid and this yellow oil is the very beginnings of the most volatile and ethereal portion of the red fume 
which is being carried along with the white fume during the early stage of the pyrolytic distillation. So let's go back now to our original symbolic diagram of what's happening in this laboratory process. And we see the original crude matter that has been heated and during a process of 20 to 22 hours roughly we obtain two substances out of that crude matter through pyrolytic distillation two substances which roughly speaking appear as two fumes a white fume and a red fume that red fume we can tell when it is beginning to rise to its fuller extent when we see these yellow deposits starting to collect at various joins and parts of the inside of the distillation train we can also see now slightly that that previously very white fume is now becoming yellowish which means that the red fume is mixing with it and the two of them are creating a kind of a yellow color and being distilled at the same time this closer picture here shows that yellow oil collecting and sticking to the inside of the distillation and the white fume a little more clearly and this picture here shows what it's like when that red fume begins condensing fully inside the condenser and turns into a deep golden yellow oil and drips down the condenser into the receiver if we remember what the previous photo of the receiving flask looked like we could see that milky white substance with that very ethereal yellow oil on top now as we're moving further toward the stage of the pyrolytic distillation when more of the red oil is coming over and less of the white fume our material which we are collecting in the receiving flask is turning a deeper red color and we can see more of that oil here at the mouth of the condenser dripping into the receiving flask once both of these fumes have completely exhausted themselves and we reach a point about 20 22 hours into the pyrolytic distillation when where no more white fume has come over the red continues for a while by itself in a deep red fume and drips that are like blood going down through the condenser into the receiver when they have both exhausted themselves and no more fumes come over we are left with a black soot like substance in the boiling flask which we can see depicted here in this symbolic image in this slide we can see what we actually have obtained from this process the pyrolytic distillation is now complete and we gather together the products that we have produced from the pyrolysis and we have three basic substances in this jar a black sooty material these jars by the way are about 500 mils and this quantity of material was obtained from about 500 grams of original crude matter so we have the black sooty substance in this jar and that is what we refer to as the fixed or mineral pole of the original binary condition of matter and in this jar we have the organic or volatile pole of that original binary which contains two organic substances 
the red fume which is now a deep burgundy color and the white fume which is a milky white liquid in this container here the ancient alchemist said these are the principal substances or materials which exist at the very heart of all matter and which all matter is composed of or built upon three principal materials the principle of salt the principle of sulfur and the principle of mercury is are the names which were traditionally given to these substances The contents of both of these jars are binary in nature. This is the way that the old adepts saw this state. These two jars represent the original binary and each pole of the binary is also a binary in itself. So our black salt is made up of lead atoms which we can't see with our physical eyes because they are coated by carbon atoms which are left behind during pyrolysis when the organic atoms oxygen, hydrogen, carbon which are the basis of all organic matter the hydrogen and carbon the hydrogen and oxygen are distilled off that dark matter into here some of the carbon goes with it a little bit of the lead goes with it and form all the organic material that we have in this container because carbon is the heaviest of those organic atoms a lot of it stays behind in the reaction flask and coats all the lead the binary condition that we have in this container the oil is made up primarily of phenolic compounds there are other organic compounds in here too but they make up the smallest percentage of material the important compounds in here are the phenols and the other part of the binary are acetone molecules which is primarily what makes up this milky white volatile substance here in traditional hermetic alchemical symbolic language this material in this jar is referred to as the lion and this material in this jar is referred to as the alchemical eagle there are various depictions of the alchemical lion in traditional alchemical artwork but i picked this one for a particular reason it's an image of the green lion and it has seven stars spread out along the length of its body and these stars represent the seven stages which this mineral substance goes through as it's being processed towards the final stage where it becomes the vehicle for the philosopher's stone it passes through seven stages and these seven stages are represented by the seven symbolically by the seven traditional esoteric planets these stars represent the seven esoteric planets of the ancients and the alchemists used those planetary names as ciphers or code names for the seven stages that the salt is going to pass through this material here in this jar is represented by an eagle some mostly in alchemical literature you'll see artwork which shows the eagle with a single head but technically the proper form of the eagle that symbolizes this material is a double headed eagle because this is a twin substance there are two volatile liquids in here the way that the old adepts looked at the situation and anybody who is aware of the wider hermetic tradition and in particular the freemasonic 
side of Hermetism. The double-headed eagle is a very important symbol in the higher degrees of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, where a lot of alchemical information is crudely presented as part of those degrees. So we have two pr primary poles of the primary binary, binary, and each of these poles itself is a binary. One pole is inorganic and mineral, and the other pole is organic and volatile. These are organic compounds in here. And this is mineral compounds, the lion and the eagle. In this video footage we can see the same process that we were just looking at in the symbolic pictures and in the photos but in motion in the lab as the white fume is being distilled condensing in the condenser and we can see in the receiver the fume has not been all fully condensed but is beginning to collect in the atmosphere of the condenser of the receiver sorry and this piece of footage here we see the same process but a closer more in focus view of the still head or the elbow joint where the heat is being kept at just enough temperature for that white fume to come over and we can see down here the white fume burning off the crude matter in the bottom of the flask. This is just like a campfire or a bonfire at the beach that's letting off smoke as the wood burns but it's all being done inside a closed system. And so all of the chemicals which are being expelled by the fire are being collected and saved instead of being allowed to escape into the atmosphere. And in this piece of footage here we can see a point at roughly about the middle of the distillation. I've covered the flask and the upper part of the neck with foil to help heat the elbow or the head of the distillation train a little bit more in order to encourage the last of the white fume and the beginning of the full impact of the red fume to actually get enough heat to pass over the top of the joint. Part of the problem with this part of the process is that not all of the substances which are being distilled up here make it over the head of the joint, head of the still, but they condense below here and drip back into the bottom of the boiling flask which is very hot. So when those drips hit the bottom of the boiling flask they uh, evaporate rapidly expand the atmosphere inside the flask which of course causes an eruption of the white fume and the oil over the still head in a bit of an aggressive action. So now let's look at this symbolic depiction of the process again just in order to simplify things into a simple graphic format to make it easy to understand our original prima matera or original chaos or our original crude matter when we pass it through pyrolytic distillation it expels two fumes a white one first and then a red one and these two fumes are considered to be the main binary of matter and they leave behind when the distillation is finished a black salt a sooty black salt which Raymond Lully said was black blacker than the blackest black and I think it was Weidenfield who said blacker than the grapes of Catalonia so this sooty black salt is known as the principle of salt. The white fume is known as the principle of mercury generally. 
because some authors call both of these fumes mercury. They call this white mercury and this red mercury or mercurius duplicatus, the double mercury and name certain names like that. But generally the term mercury at this stage of the process is given to the white fume. And the term principle of sulfur is given to the red fume. Now because these two fumes are considered to be the main binary of the substances that are used to produce the philosopher's stone, there are a couple of other very common names that are given to these substances in alchemical literature. The white fume is known as Luna, La Luna, or Luna, or Our Moon, or Our Silver, or Quicksilver, Mercury, Living Silver. And the red fume is given the symbolic name Soul, or Our Gold, the Sun. And so these two fumes, when we hear the old alchemists talking about the sun and the moon, or our gold and our silver, they are talking about these two fumes and the substances that they condense into. And this salt, in relation to the sun and the moon, is the earth, sometimes, or our antimony, or the lead of the philosophers. Now if we take these two fumes as they come condensed, remember the right hand picture of the jar that I showed you where the two liquids are in the right hand jar and the red oil is floating on top of the white mercury. If we take those two liquids and put them into a clean distillation train and distill them, we can distill the mercury because it's the most volatile substance that will come over at the lowest heat. We can distill that off cleanly and, theref and, and thereby separate the oil from the mercury, the sulfur from the mercury, split the binary, separate the poles and contain them individually. Once we have the, the mercury separated from the sulfur, we can then take each of these separately, put them in a clean distillation train, and distill them by themselves, and split them again. Each pole of a binary is also a binary within itself. So for example, if we take the sulfur principle by itself and begin distilling it, a volatile oil comes over. And we saw that volatile oil in the early photograph of the early stage of pyrolysis, where it was floating on top of the virgin's milk. A very clear yellow oil, very volatile, like the essential oil of a plant. And this substance, because of certain characteristics it has, the old alchemists referred to this substance as the element of fire. Once all of that fire is distilled off, it leaves a hard, sticky, and then eventually dry and minerally black substance in the bottom of the distilling flask. And that substance the alchemists called earth, the element of earth. Then if we take the mercury by itself, put it into a clean, fresh distillation train, and begin to distill it, the most volatile part comes over first, and that is chemically known as acetone. The old adepts called it the element of air because acetone, in its pure state, if left in an open container in ambient conditions, just in the room, will evaporate into the air. In other words, it will become a gas immediately. Its natural state in an open air container is a gas. So because it's a gas, they called it the element of air. 
and once the acetone is distilled completely off it leaves behind a grosser substance which is the element of water in fact it is H2O the chemical element of water molecule of water so now from two substances we have four substances and these are the four elements of the alchemists we began originally with one thing which was our crude matter our prima materia or our chaos we attained from it two things a fixed material and a bunch of volatile material and also these two poles sulfur and mercury and then we had three things the three principles sulfur mercury and salt and then from the two volatile substances we then have four things the four alchemical elements So here we have it, the end of the first major stage of the alchemical great work, which the old adepts called the stage or process of separation. And this process of separation largely involves two techniques, pyrolytic distillation, which decomposes, the original crude matter and distillation which separates the products of pyrolysis into four elements. This stage of separation is often referred to by an axiom which a number of adepts have repeated which says our work begins in death and darkness or something similar. In other words, the matter is killed by pyrolysis, a Greek word, compound word meaning death by fire. Pyro, fire, lysis means death or decomposition, pyrolysis. And blackness, our work begins in death and blackness because the matter turns black which is a sign of death and of the first stage of the great work. And by the end of that first stage of separation we have all four elements separated. So the important thing is we started off ideally with one substance, the crude matter or chaos, and we pass it through a number of processes and we end up with four substances. This is very important. The four substances are obtained from the products of pyrolysis by fractional distillation, which is a bit of a complicated technical term. What it means is if we take the oil and the mercury and put them into a distillation train, slowly begin turning the temperature up in stages gradually over a long period of time, as the heat slowly increases and warms up those that oil and that mercury, the sulfur and the mercury, we will first get acetone being distilled off, then we will get water being distilled off, then we will get a volatile oil, and then we will have remaining at the bottom of the flask a mineral salt. What the old alchemists told us, and this is in a manner true that if we take our blessed or ardent water which is the oil, sulfur and the mercury the oil and the mercury and we distill it it can only be separated into four substances it won't be separated into any more than four substances so what they said from this what they deducted or concluded from this was that all things in the physical world because plants, animals, minerals and metals when exposed to this process all produce the same conditions of matter and end up being decomposed into four elements. What the old adepts concluded from this was all things in reality 
are made up of four elements. This is an extremely important principle at the very heart of Hermetic philosophy. And it's a very ancient principle because the very first alchemists played around with pyrolysis at least three and a half thousand years ago and discovered for themselves in their view of reality to the extent that their understanding of physics and chemistry could allow them to understand that matter could be decomposed into four conditions and every substance was composed of these conditions. So that's it for this podcast, podcast 28. There is a great deal that can be said about the hermetic view of the four elements. A lot of detail about the evolution of those elements and where they come from, uh, how they, they are constructed and the conditions under which they develop. But it was my intention here just to point out clearly and in detail where the concept of the four elements comes from. Because most people who are involved in hermetic study, especially people in the magical tradition, talk about the elements and less regularly about the alchemical principles, but they have no idea where these concepts first originated how they arose and how they were originally looked at by the old adepts of the Hermetic tradition going back in history in both the Western tradition and back into the Middle East. So it is important, in my opinion, to understand first of all what the true nature of these elements are because of where the concept and understanding of these elements originated from. So I hope this podcast helped to explain that situation and provide some inspiration for further understanding through your own contemplation and study. The subject of podcast number 29, the next podcast, will focus on the next or third stage of the great work, which is where the elements are cleaned where they have their impurities removed and where they begin to go through the process of being reintegrated back together into one unit. Up to this point, everything that I have spoken about in the previous podcast on this subject, up to this point in podcast 28, most of the understanding of what we call today the acetate path or the great work of Saturn is relatively commonly known about and relatively generally understood in the mainstream of alchemical study. So that is most people who know about advanced laboratory alchemy or who read about it and have been involved in some serious pursuit of the lab work know about the acetate path and they know about pyrolysis and the products that come out of that distillation. The bulk of people who are involved in the acetate path, especially its practice though, while they understand the pieces of the subject I have talked about up to this point, everything I'm going to start speaking about from here on forward, beginning with podcast number 29, are understood only by a small number of individuals, understood by a small number of individuals. Most of the knowledge, most of it, that I'm going to speak about from here on forward is not at all really understood by anybody with any degree of interest in alchemy or the acetate path at all. So we're now crossing a line between relatively common knowledge and knowledge that is very confusing and vague to the 
vast number of people who are involved in alchemical study. So most people who get to the point that we've talked about now and have the blessed water or the ardent water and start to play around with distilling it and cleaning it and separating the elements suddenly find themselves in a position where they don't really know what to do from this point on. So they do a lot of reading and most of that reading is old texts written by the old adepts and the information which they provide about the processes from this point on is very vague it's enciphered in old symbolic metaphorical allegorical hermetic language and few people understand it so the kinds of explanations i'm going to give from this point on are ideas that only a small number of people when i say a small number we're talking um, in the ballpark of about a couple of dozen people internationally in the present day have any idea at all about what goes on from here on forward so this is one of the reasons why it is important to discuss clearly accurate teaching where the stages from here on forward are concerned and it's very difficult to understand what I'll be discussing from here on forward unless you paid very good attention to the previous podcasts in this series so that you have a well-rounded understanding of the initial basics of language and concepts where pyrolytic distillation is concerned. So, with any luck, it will only be about another month or so before podcast 29. I hope you tune in for that upload and I'll see you then.